Stalham is a name usually associated with the Broads. It's a small market town, old, and can trace its history back to the Doomsday Book. Actually, it forms the northern point of a triangle of Broadland, with Norwich in the west and Lowestoft to the south. It's Tuesday and market day and has been for about the last 700 years. The church provides a focal point every market day for refreshments and a rest. The market is held in this large field. In days gone by, it was mostly livestock, etc. But these days are long, long, long since gone. And today, the commodities are food with auctions of various types. This is the open auction. If you have anything to dispose of, bring it along. It might make pence or pounds. It looks like rubbish, but each week the auctioneer seems to clear it. The open auction is anything you care to think of. If it's better quality, it goes in the closed auction, which you see here. This is the flower and vegetable market close by. Most of the vegetables have gone already. We're back in the high street in the afternoon. The bustle has subsided. And it's getting back to normal. What you see here is the total length of the high street. We are now down to the entrance to the boat yards. Further down the road leads probably to the oldest and big, busiest part of the old Stalham. Round about you see the old buildings and warehouses which were used in the past to store and handle the vast amount of goods brought in and out by the wherries. Timber, 
coal, wool, etc. That's the 149 road at the bottom. This is the end of the stave. This boat runs daily trips, except Saturdays, down to the Barton Broad and further. Along the banks are hundreds and hundreds of these ducks and geese. They're not frightened as you can see. The boat has loaded and set sail. And now on its journey down to Barton Broad. It's very popular. And the scenery is spectacular. It's Saturday afternoon and really a different story to midweek. This Kingfisher King. The changeover is in full swing. Boats being cleaned out, refueled, water tanks being filled, etc. And the new hirers loading their equipment. Incidentally, this is Heron Key. Large crane can lift the boats out bodily for repairs, etc. The next key along is Swallow Key. Incidentally, various companies use the boat yards. It's big business, as you can see. 
Haysboro. Not pronounced as it's spelled. There are many towns in Norfolk like this. But the names sound different to the spelling. Down the runway where the lifeboat goes. about four miles from Stalham and has a reputation for its notorious sandbanks some 12 miles offshore which have been the site of many many a wreck. The erosion, <coughs> the erosion at this part of the coast is terrific. What a nice little beach. You can see the cliffs are very soft hence the erosion. These heavy ramparts serve to slacken the onslaught of the North Sea. The lighthouse was built in 1791 by the Trinity House Brethren. It is 100 feet tall and serves its purpose well. The church is part of Haysborough's history. There is an entry in the Doomsday Survey of 1068 of a church. Not the one you see now, this is a 15th century building. In the churchyard lay buried berries, <coughs> the remains of many a sailor, including 32 men from the HMS Peggy, 1770, 119 from HMS Invincible, 1801, and most of the crew of HMS Hunter, 1804, all victims of the sandbanks. font is exceptionally good. It dates back to the 15th century and considered to be one of the finest in East Anglia. I think it's an official church. The West Tower with its battlement parapet is 110 feet tall and is considered the most perfectly proportioned East Anglian church where there are so many in this district. This just shows you what the local bus has to contend with in the narrow roads. 
there's just about enough room for a bus to pass and someone was taking fuel in it took us 20 minutes to get past this Amazing how these drivers do these journeys day after day. They collect up from the various villages on the way to Norwich. That's Sir Peter Mancroft Church. Superb building. Starts in 1455. We're now looking over the covered market. It's the largest in situ covered market in the country and goes back some 500 years. The old guild, guild hall made of flint and stone goes back to 1407 and was the seat of local government until 1938 and the city hall took over you are now in gentleman's walk with a good view of the Civic Hall. We're looking up Raw Arcade, and there is the old castle in the background. It's a constant reminder of the Norman Conquest. Originally a timber structure, the stone one was built in 1120. It was repla replaced with bar stone in 1834, and it's what you see today. It's now a museum, but previously a county jail for 500 years. The River Wenson formed a loop round the cathedral and the town centre and this is the bridge at St George's Street there are pleasant walkways along the river bank and many of these restaurants and ale houses still remain Now looking at Fire Bridge. Another old public house there. Incidentally, Fire Bridge is the oldest of the river crossings, dating back to Roman times. We're now looking up towards Quayside on the right. At this point was the old ducking stool.
is Whitefriars Bridge. At the end of Whitefriars Bridge is all that remains of the Whitefriars Monastery gate. Dates back to 1256. left is the Church of St Martin's at Palace, the cathedral in the background. Here are the junction of Palace Street and Wenson Street, and in front of the Maid's Head Hotel. On the plinth is the bust of Nurse Cavill, a native of Norwich who was shot by the Germans in World War I for helping Allied prisoners to escape in Belgium. Her grave is nearby. That's Irpington Gate. Tombland Alley, we're at the lower end of Tombland. Not connected with tombs, it's an old Saxon word meaning meeting place, Tumland. This is probably one of the oldest parts of Norwich. St George's Church, built in about 1460. The mounds either side presumably lay the remains of people dying in the Black Death. That lopsided building is Augustine Stewart House, built in 1549, now undergoing repairs. And George's Church again. We're now at the top end of Tombland. Facing us is the other gate leading to the Cathedral Forecourt, St Ethelbert's Gate, built in 1300. Actually, as a penance by the people of Norwich for rioting. It's a beautiful old gate. Inside the forecourt are two statues, one at either end. This one is of the Duke of Wellington. Norwich composed of a beautiful cathedral not built of English stone, but stone from Calm in Normandy, which the Normans brought over after the conquest. Down the steps to the cloisters, a magnificent 180 foot square walk Begun in 1297, but not complete till 1430. A long time, but the Black Death occurred in these times and devastated the population. Delightful view of the tower through one of the cloister arches. On the walls you see coats of arms. 
they are, as far as is known, those of the landed gentry of Norwich who were entertained in the cloisters by Queen Elizabeth I in 1578. Inside the cathedral and a wonderful view of the vaulted roof, so strongly made that the incendiary bombs of 1942 failed to catch. The other end of the cathedral forecourt and a statue of Lord Nelson, who knew Norwich well. He was a scholar at the local school. rear of Irpington Gate, a party of tourists, Norwich enjoys hosts of foreign tourists, view of the west door, west end of the cathedral, North Waltham can be described as a pleasant market town, only some 10 miles from the coast. But in gone by days, it was probably one of the most prosperous wool towns. It had the village of Worcester only four miles away, where the famous Worcester cloth was first made. Even today it's played as one of the finest cloths. market day, there are stalls in the street and in the side streets. It's a one-way system through the town. The Church of St Nicholas is well worth a visit. It's in the town centre amidst pleasant surroundings. Its building commenced about 1330 and it was not completed until towards the end of the century. The Black Death Plague again causing a delay. towards the south door and the broken tower. When the building was completed, it had a battlement and a spire reaching a height of 170 feet make it only second to Norwich. However, on the 16th of May 1724, the church records say, after the Ascension Fair, when the bells were rang all day, the spire came tumbling down. So it remains to this day. However, it's quite a feature of the town. There were gargoyles on the four corners of the battlements. Two remain inside still. This is the 
south door and the entrance. As you see the high street is only a few yards away. Inside there are some very interesting items to see. There's one of the gargoyles. There's one behind where the lads are. This is one of the interesting features, the pelican font. It rises in succession of arches, balusters and pinnacles to a pelican feeding her nestlings at the top. Its bottom section is lifted for use. It dates back to about the 1450s. The hill organ was first installed in 1873. Behind it is a huge chest or hutch. It dates back a long, long time. It's very unusual in as much as it has seven locks. In olden days, seven people had a key, one each, which gave them great security. This is the tomb of Sir William Paston. He was a local celebrity of years gone by. He founded the local grammar school, now a college, which still bears his name. Many notable scholars passed through it in the years past, including Lord Nelson. The South Chapel, in old days dedicated to St Thomas the Becket of Canterbury.